Ellen, I was trained in biology, my doctorate's in neuroscience, and I've been interested in philosophy my whole life. But until very recently, I never put the two together. I was never concerned or interested in the philosophy of biology. Now looking at it, maybe because that was specifically evolutionary biology as the tradition, uh, the, the core concept in philosophy of biology for a long time, and that was not necessarily my area. I was interested in neuroscience. Uh, but f from your work and, and your experience in philosophy, why is philosophy uh, important for biology? And potentially, why is biology important for philosophy? I think I'll focus on the question, like as a philosopher, I want to focus on the question about why biologists should care about uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think just the general genealogical uh, origins of biology. So biology just originated from philosophy. So it has deeply philosophical roots like all disciplines. And it, it's only like in the 19th century that it became an independent discipline. And so it's really important to, to try to think about the concepts that are being used in biology and how we can work with those. Uh, so, for example, take agency. Agency in biology, like at some point in the 70s, 60s, uh, you had people like George Williams, and they wanted to focus on genes. And they said, look, fitness is just a matter of genes, mm -hmm. you know, genes going from one generation to the other generation. And agents were completely out of the picture, like the fact that those genes were in organisms mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. had to do stuff mm -hmm. in order to get the genes mm -hmm. to the next generation, mm -hmm. sort of really failed into the background. And it really took until uh, Richard Lewontin, who recently died, so that's why I'm reminded of this. He wrote in the 1980s, when it was really not popular, the role of agency in biology mm. is very, very crucial. Like animals, even plants, and, and even you know viruses, they are agents with interests and a point of view. The fact even that you can as an organism that you, you have agency and that you are the, the thing that is making the genes going from one generation, mm -hmm. even if, it's, if selection works only on the genes, it's going to generate all sorts of interesting and non-obvious properties mm -hmm. in those organisms. So for example, the fact that we have subjectivity and consciousness is really a consequence of the fact that we are agents. Uh, that we are biological agents. So you see here how deep questions about, you know, what's consciousness, I think ultimately they relate to biological questions. Yeah, one can make the opposite argument too, that the causation says that you start with consciousness and then become an agent. You're, you're looking at um, uh, agency as a potential motivation for the evolution of consciousness. Yes, you could go the other way. But the thing is, suppose you're purely conscious. So there are science fiction stories yeah. like that. Like you have a totally yeah. conscious planet. It doesn't do anything, but it's super conscious. Mm. Like why? That, that's the problem. Like it seems to me like these things have to be in lockstep. Mm. So you have agency and you have subjectivity and those two are tightly related. Mm. So for example, plants, we didn't used to know that plants in fact have all sorts of chemical receptors and right, transmitters right, right. to also communicate with each other. But why would they communicate with each other? Well, because they can do things, like they can fight off pathogens. They can, uh, they basically have ways, very subtle ways of exerting an influence on their environment. So consciousness only biologically matters to the extent that you can actually do something with it. So mm -hmm. the two sort of evolve together. What, what other uh, questions in philosophy uh, can uh, help biologists uh, in, in their work and develop biology more richly? There's so many things. One thing that I'm really, really interested in that I find very cool is the idea of contingency versus convergence. It's a deep philosophical question. So you have a thought experiment by Stephen Jay Gould about you have the Burgess Shale, which is this very rich Cambrian uh, era, about 500 million uh, years old. And you see, you have all these organisms of the Cambrian explosion. And he said, okay, take the Burgess Shale Rewind the tape to there, forward wind. We're going to see very different things. We will not be around. So that's the idea of contingency. Contingency is like 
radically different. Like, so if you had alien life, it could be radically different because evolution just goes wherever. It's very sensitive to initial conditions. Mm. It's very sensitive to like weird events, uh, sort of like mass extinction. It's not just could be different, it almost certainly would be different. It would be. So this is not just a claim about could be, but a claim about would be. Like if there were space aliens, hopefully, (laughs) then they would be very different from us. But then you have the other idea of convergence. Convergence is, look at all the similarities. Look at how many creatures have eyes. Eyes have have evolved in so many different uh, clades, so many different ways of doing it, but they all have eyes. Or like um, other things like appendages to, you know, like for locomotion. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other idea, like Simon Conway Morris and Colin McGee, who argue that convergence is what you should expect. So that's a deep philosophical question. Which of those two is it? And I think actually um, you need philosophical tools to find this out. Because you could, of course, just do catalog and say, look, eyes have evolved so many times, and you know, uh, smell has evolved so many times, but we don't have like a baseline or base rate because there must be also instances where it didn't evolve, right? So for example, we don't have wings, uh, so, uh, but, but bats and, and birds have wings. So, so you have to have an idea about what's the baseline rate of mm. convergence mm. that you would expect if convergence were true mm. and you need philosophical tools. It's not a purely empirical question, but it is a very important question. So if you take those two together, if you take on the one hand the question of whether contingency or convergence are true, and on the other hand, the shaping of agents of their own evolutionary fate, then you can see how philosophy of biology integrates both the empirical data and the sort of conceptual tools that I think philosophy is particularly good at giving us. And that's why I think biologists should sort of continue to be both philosophically cognizant and uh, sort of be informed by these philosophical ideas and how they inform uh, their work.